Well, here I am back from the Dayton FDIM Hamvention 2022. Had a fantastic time. I've just about started to catch up with all the email backlog and the help desk tickets backlog. Uh, just about started to get over the COVID-19 I caught while I was there. And so just now uh, time to talk about the 2N2222 challenge. So what is the 2N2222 challenge? Well, this is a challenge set up by QRP FDIM and you basically have to get as much power up as you can from two transistors to 2N2222A transistors in their metal case. Actually, I'm not sure it specifies the metal, the metal case, but uh, that's typically what we <coughs> think of using. Um, so this is the metal case version of the 2N2222A, the original old version. And uh, you use a crystal oscillator and a power amplifier to get as much power as you can out of two of them. So you have a continuous one minute key down and the competition entry is defined as the least power during that one minute, which is what happens at the end of the one minute typically as the transistors heat up and get less efficient. So here is my competition entry. I'm using the two 2N222As in a push-pull configuration and uh, I'm using a, I got a one meter length of this air conditioner pipe, this copper air conditioner pipe, and it just so happens that the um, what the quarter inch diameter pipe has about a 4.8 millimeter inside diameter, which is a very, very tight fit on the uh, 2N2222As. And so it was perfect for creating two heat sinks. Now the collector of the 2N22A is actually the uh, case here so it is necessary to do some insulating so what I've done here is uh, used PCB material to uh, make supports for the um, heat sink tubing and but also insulated it as you can see uh, insulated it here so that there's no electrical connection to the ground plane and then I soldered capacitors directly to this uh, to these uh, tubes. Underneath I have a big transformer which I'll explain in a moment and one of the windings has a crystal on it which you can really sort of hardly see stuck in there. And I have a beehive capacitor, trimmer capacitor and these are very interesting because if you open this up you'll see that inside there are these concentric cylinders and this came out of an ambulance transceiver from I guess the 60s, possibly 70s in the UK, uh, VHF transceiver. So as you screw that on, the concentric cylinders have a varying amount of overlap which produces a variable capacitance and that covers 0 to 30 picofarads. Now this challenge had been running at FDIM uh, for several years, I think 2017, 18, 19, and the previous record was 2.0 watts of power up from two to N22 transistors. Now the typical approach to this might be to have one transistor as a crystal oscillator and the other one as a power amplifier, but what I've done is a little bit different. So I thought we need to use both transistors in a symmetric configuration to get the most out of them uh, to most of their power dissipation ratings. Um, I don't mind exceeding the power dissipation rating in the data sheet. The thing only has to survive for one minute of continuous key down. So um, what happens after that, I don't really care. Whether it lives for a short time or a long time doesn't matter. So I started from the assumption that we would need to use both transistors equally in a symmetric con configuration to get the most power up from both. And then the next thing I wanted to do was operate them in a class of operation that was efficient as possible. Now, class E is the most efficient I know of, and what we do here, we have a resonant load circuit, um, which, uh, and we also drive the transistors into saturation, so they're operating as much as possible on-off as switches. And so I came up with this circuit, which is pretty much uh, like the old RC Astable multivibrators we used to make as teenagers with resistors and capacitors flashing LEDs or perhaps operating relays clack 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 or as a sound generator. And I had the 
idea that we would use as little resistance as possible in the circuit because resistors dissipate power and uh, so we don't want to waste any power in the, in the circuit. So there's a resonant circuit which is made up of the uh, winding here, the center tapped winding of this transformer, which is 14 turns on a T80 6 powdered iron toroid. And that's paralleled with this capacitance here, which I made up of a number of uh, smaller capacitors in, in parallel that you can see on the actual device here, and a trimmer capacitor, which is that beehive capacitor I was talking about earlier. And there's an additional winding, a 15 turn winding on this on this horrendous transformer, which is connected just to a 7.030 megahertz crystal. And what happens is when you tune the LC resonant winding to within about plus minus 100 kilohertz of the resonant frequency of the crystal, the crystal takes over and locks it onto frequency. So that satisfies the requirement of being a crystal controlled oscillator. Well, DC power is fed in uh, from the midpoint of the resonant winding via a choke, which is wound as, as 12 turns on an FT50-43 ferrite toroid. I did try separate tor toroids with 10 turns, 12 turns, 9 turns from each collector to plus volts, but it didn't really make any difference. Finally, there's an output winding on the right-hand side of the diagram, which uh, matches the impedance to a 50 ohm loan load. And I initially had far too many turns on this, and uh, my friend Ross EX0AA did some modeling in a simulator and said you need to use lower turns. And so I tried that and instantly the power output went up and the efficiency went up. So I was getting something like uh, over 80% efficiency at, at, in some of these circuits. And I tried various feedback mechanisms uh, using transformer windings, additional windings fed into the bases of the transistors. I tried capacitive feedback. I tried putting a crystal in series to a transformer that was driving the bases in antiphase. I tried all sorts of things and all of them produced either less power output or blew up the transistors or produced lower efficiency. And so the best configuration, is, configuration I could come up with is this one with the feedback capacitors from the opposing collectors to base. So it then remains to optimize the component values and uh, that's an awful, awful lot of trial and error. The bias resistors should be as low as possible uh, to get as much current going as we can. But if you make the bias resistors too low, then the oscillation stops and the transistors get destroyed instantly. For the same reason, you also want to minimize these uh, capacitors, feedback capacitors, because if they're too large, you get overlap in the pulses on the, through the transistor. And what that does is then cancel out in the output transformer and also reduces the efficiency and the power output. Now here's an example with a 6.2K bias resistor and 36 picofarads of feedback capacitance. That was as low as I could get these resistors and capacitors and it produced a very satisfactory efficiency of over 80% there. And as I increased the supply volts, I got up well over 3 watts of power output. But that was with a very short key down and the problem is that if you keep a longer key down, the transistors warm up and the efficiency decreases and the point of, of optimum component values changes and you reach a point where the oscillation stops and the transistors burn out almost immediately. So in order to avoid this condition, it was necessary to back off a bit from the optimum values and to use a, um, I used a 22K bias resistor and 39 picofarads of feedback capacitance. And that leaves some safety margins so that when you get up to the uh, higher voltages and higher power outputs, you don't blow everything up. So on the oscilloscope, it looked like a very nice uh, sine wave. And uh, one of the advantages of push-pull circuits is you have a very low level of even harmonics. So um, that's a useful out a side effect. Now here on this oscilloscope, trace of the two collector voltage waveforms and you can see that they're quite nice pulses, quite nice class E operation. There is a little bit of overlap but you know it's very imperfect to expect to be able to get a really true uh, class E push-pull amplifier from just two transistors. 
Now the spectrum analyzer output shows the expected level of low level of even harmonics, and even the third harmonic is about 33 or 34 decibels down on the fundamental, so it's a pretty clean oscillator even without any low pass filtering after it. I was surprised to find quite a large amount of variation, so I measured the HFE uh, just on a, a cheap DMM. Here is an example, so just plugging the uh, transistor into the uh, transistor socket here and having it in HFE mode. This one measures about 420. I had quite a large variation. I had some measure as low as 1, which is ridiculous, and others measured as high as 707, so there's a very wide range there. And what I did in the end was chose some matched pairs, but I found it didn't really make any difference whether the pairs were matched or not. Um, it, maybe a 1% or 2% on the efficiency, but nothing really spectacular. So here's a chart of the final configuration I ended up with, two transistors which measured 91 and 93 HFE, and with a 22K BIOS resistor and 39 picofarad feedback capacitor. And I took this all the way up to 21 volt supply, which gave me about 3.8 watts of power output, which was pretty impressive, and the efficiency was hovering around 75%. Um, so to calculate the efficiency, I'm measuring the output power and I'm measuring the DC input voltage and the DC current through the circuit to calculate the input power and the efficiency is the ratio of output power divided by input power. Finally, the great day came and it was club night at FDIM in the, in the uh, hotel conference room and we set up the device for its test runs. Now you're allowed two test runs, and the power output that is officially entered into the competition is the best of the two. So it turned out that I was the only entrant this year, and so winning by default was one thing. But, of course, there was no guarantee that the thing had survived the very, very long journey from Turkey in my suitcase, along with all the other kits rattling around in there. And so... Uh, I was quite nervous and you know, I was not sure that my power measurement would have been the same as theirs. I was using an oscilloscope to measure across the uh, dummy load and so there's no guarantee as well that my power supply was the same or my dummy load was the same, maybe theirs was reactive or the cable or whatever. So I was nervous anyway that things would work out but in the end it went very very well. And so I set the first one to 19 volt supply and the second, and that survived and it was over 3, watt, three watts power output. And then the second run, I set it at 21 volts, which produced 3.68 watt supply at the end of the one minute run. But it still survived, and we continued on past that to do another run um, at higher voltages and higher voltages until at 24 volts it produced 4.1 watts of power output. Now bear in mind the previous record was 2 watts, and so there's quite a a crowd of people uh, gathered round who really hoped that this thing was going to blow up spectacularly. And I kept telling them, these transistors don't blow up spectacularly. If you want to do that, you need an RF-510. Uh, they go off like a shotgun with a very loud bang. But if 2N222As really just fail silently and there's nothing exciting there at all. Anyway, people were pretty impressed by the 4.1 watts output and... Uh, it uh, at 25 volt supply produced a little bit lower than 4.1 watts output, so we'd clearly passed the point at which the transistors were not happy and they were getting hot um, and reducing the efficiency. Oh, oh look at that! It's almost that size. 4.75. The unsmokable transistor. The unsmokable transistor. Yeah, I think you're at the diminishing returns point here. You're at yeah. back to where you were power wise. But it's a pretty stable. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's very stable. Yeah, you're going to be right back where you started from. That just a little less. So you're in the abuse range now. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we still we blow it up. Well, if you blow it up, it's not going to prove anything. Well, Dave NM0S also uh, suggested I could put this into the homebrew competition, and there was one category which had no other entrants, so of course I won that one too, and that was the test equipment category. So I said, what do you mean test equipment? He said, of course, it's a device for testing dummy loads. But it was hard to disagree with that. And here is the prestigious trophy, which is actually... Uh, uh, steel plate from the Dollar Tree store in America and uh, neatly inscribed with the uh, competition date and the winning entry which was 3.68 watts. It was only after that that we continued to push it further to get 4.1 watts. Now Dave NM0S also said that this is actually a current driven class D oscillator not actually a Class E oscillator which would require capacitors from the collectors to ground. So I had actually tried that configuration but I've not really seen any improvement in efficiency so I'd gone back to having the capacitors between the two collectors. So overall it was a lot of fun and you know I had been enviously looking at these homebrew entrants at FDIM each year and uh, now finally I saw my, I was able to enter myself and enter the competition myself. So I was very happy with the project and it was really the highlight or one of the highlights of the whole uh, trip. So there we go, that's my entry into the 2N222A uh, power challenge and perhaps you could try it too. I'm, I'm sure you can get over 5 watts with this as long as you're not doing continuous key downs. Um, so it's a pretty fun project. So I hope you enjoyed this short video from the QRP Labs headquarters. See you again soon. Bye bye for now.